So it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor David Weisberg to speak to you. Well done. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. My uh, lateness here, because I kind of get lost outside, reminds me of a story that I'll start off with. It's about Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was an associate justice of the Supreme Court in the US, and a very distinctive looking gentleman with a sort of long beard, and I was a, a justice for many years. The story goes, told to me by a federal judge in DC, that Holmes was on a train uh, leaving Washington and the conductor came up to Holmes and said, uh, sir, can I have your ticket, please? And Holmes started looking through here and there. He had a reputation for being very forgetful, might be late for his speech, et cetera. And, but he couldn't find his ticket. And so the uh, conductor at this point recognized him. He was often in the newspaper. And he said to him, oh, don't worry, uh, Justice Holmes. When you find the, the ticket, just send it to the rail company. And Holmes is supposed to have said, uh, young man, the problem is not where is my ticket, it's where am I going. <laughs> so um, where I'm going today is to tell you about a sort of very different world of crime prevention. Uh, the title of my talk is Hotspots of Crime uh, and Crime Prevention. Now traditionally, when we think about crime prevention, uh, as we heard a little bit before, uh, we think about who done it. Um, so uh, in this cartoon, for example, the fellow on the, on the left says, uh, apart from illiteracy, low self-esteem, homelessness, poverty, and a broken home, I can't find any reason for his offending behavior. Uh, and the other guy says, it's a mystery. Well, that's the mystery that criminologists and crime prevention experts uh, often focus upon. Uh, but I'm going to focus on something different, and these three guys uh, say it pretty well, location, location, location. At the end of my speech, you'll see whether I've sort of improved on what they've uh, brought forth. Uh, but I'm going to ask the question of where done it. And I'm going to suggest that asking the question where done it can tell us an awful lot about crime and can help us a an awful lot in terms of crime prevention. Now, when I say we're done it, it's very different from the traditional we're done it in criminology, which is the community-based crime prevention uh, of the Chicago School, uh, which began really in the early uh, 1920s, uh, to look at the question of how communities might relate to crime. For example, this is a, a figure from uh, Thrasher, who wrote a very famous book uh, on the gang. At that time, you wrote only one book in your career, so to speak, one magnum opus, but it's still being used. And you see he has the slum area. Well, that part of town is very socially disorganized and problematic, and that leads to the creation of gangs and crime. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about where done it. I'm talking about a very micro-geographic approach. Uh, it could be just a single address or facility. Uh, it could be, as you see in the left here, a street segment. It's a unit I often use. This is from the Minneapolis Hotspots experiment, from intersection to intersection. Or it could be a small group of streets. Uh, on your right, I'll tell you about this study too later. This is from the Jersey City Displacement Diffusion Project. Uh, but it could be a group of street segments, let's say, that have a similar crime problem. But this is very different from the large area community neighborhood focus that criminologists often use when they were thinking about place. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through, in a sense, the, uh, I'm going to start with the logic model for place-based prevention, for why we ought to be focusing on these micro-geographic units. I'm going to show you that there's what I call a law of crime concentration, that crime is very, very tightly concentrated in a relatively small number of places in a city. That, of course, perhaps suggests that the police and other crime prevention experts should be focused there as well. I'm going to show you that it's not about, it's not like all these places are in the same neighborhood. We have one bad neighborhood of town. We've got to operate there. In fact, these hotspots of crime are spread throughout the city landscape. And then I'm going to show you that there are specific characteristics that link uh, uh, these places to crime. And that provides us with, if you like, some thoughts about or some ideas about what we could possibly do to do something about these places. Now, I'm not going to only show you there's a good logic model. Crime is concentrated. There are certain characteristics that concentrate them. If we can do something about those, we can reduce crime. It's also the case that we have very strong scientific evidence, at least in the area of policing so far, that hotspots prevention works. <laughs> 
And moreover, because this is usually the objection or often the objection, people say, if I push down here, it's just going to pop up here, the balloon model. Well, that turns out not to be the case empirically. Crime does not simply move around the corner. And I'll show you some evidence for that. And finally, I'm going to talk about a new area that I've become interested in. I like to joke to myself that after I started this work about 25 years ago, and when I started, people were like, what are you doing? You know, like, well, that's kind of strange. And now it's become, I think, quite accepted around the world. But now I'm sort of off to something else, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, which is uh, social prevention hotspots. I won't show you any uh, scientific evidence. I'll tell you about some studies we're running now. Okay, so let's start with the law of crime concentration at places. It's really quite simple. This is a, uh, this is a figure that includes uh, five large, larger cities. Uh, they're very different one from another. Uh, Sacramento, California, uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, New York City, Tel Aviv, and Cincinnati. They're all large cities, uh, I believe over 350,000 or so, uh, but they range from that to New York City, which is uh, over 8 million now. Uh, they have in very different places. One is in Israel, one, uh, the rest are in the US. But look what happens here. When I ask the question, where is 50% of the crime? Let me just uh, tell you how I did this. Uh, I like to work with the street segment from intersection to intersection because I believe that has a kind of social context to it. So what I did in each of these cities was I divided up the city into thousands and thousands of street segments. For example, in New York City, there are about 40 some odd thousand. In Seattle, there are about uh, 24,000. And then I asked the question, uh, and what percent of those street segments is 50% of the crime? And that's the uh, pinkish color. I'm a little colorblind. I'm not sure what color that is. But uh, you'll see that it's about from 4 to 6% of the street segments produce 50% of the crime in all those cities. So there seems to be, no matter where we go, in every city I go into and, and conduct the same enterprise of the larger cities, uh, that's what we find. Well, if only 4% of the streets, or 5 or 6% of the streets, produce 50% of the crime, should we be spreading our crime prevention resources all throughout the city? Now, if I ask what percent of those streets produce 25% of crime, I get about 1%, between 0.8 and 1.6. Let's say about 1% of the streets produce 25% of the crime. You can go to the 1% of the streets in the city. They don't move around, remember, like offenders. And you can get it at about 25% of the crime. Well, that's a really important fact for crime prevention. Now, for a, a lecture I gave when I received the Southern Award this year in San Francisco, uh, I tried to look at uh, less urbanized cities, and no one's ever looked at that before. I wondered whether they'd be less or more concentrated than larger cities. So you have three examples. It's the cities I could find that would provide data. Uh, these are three examples. They're cities under 100,000 population, but they're cities. They're not just uh, suburban areas. And what you can see here is the crime is even more concentrated. In these smaller cities, between 2 and 4% of the streets produce 50% of the crime. And amazingly so, about half a percent of the streets produce 25% of the crime. So the hotspots idea seems to work across cities. And as the cities get smaller, oh, this is sort of a hypothesis we still have to investigate, uh, it seems to get even more concentrated. And it's not only across cities. It's also within cities across time. Uh, I don't know if I have a, I can't use the pointer anyway. Uh, but if you look here, you'll see there are four cities I was able to get longitudinal data. And what you can see at the, uh, the lines at the bottom, uh, the solid lines, one is the 5% line, uh, excuse me, the 50% line for crime, and the other is the 25% line. Uh, and as you can see, there's some fluctuation, but overall these percentages stay relatively stable, especially, for example, in Seattle or in Brooklyn Park, uh, uh, they, it's not only that we have a law of crime concentration across cities, it's also within cities across time. Over time, a very small proportion, about 5% of the streets in larger cities, about 3% of the streets uh, uh, in smaller cities, produce about half the crime. Uh, about 1% of the streets in larger cities and about half a percent of the streets in the smaller cities produce uh, about 25% of the crime. And these things seem to hold at least longitudinally. Now, what I've added to this is the, uh, the crime incidence each year in these cities. And what you can see is, while the concentration of crime remains relatively stable, the patterns of the crime incidence over time train, change uh, rather uh, dramatically. Look at Seattle, this strong declining trend. 
and the, uh, the uh, uh, trend of concentrations remains stable. So crime incidents go way down, about 25% down, and the crime incidents remain stable. And the, the, it varies across these different sorts of places. But the mind point is that we have a law of crime concentration. A lot of the crime, half of it, is concentrated at a relatively small number of places. Uh, to get at 25% of the crime in the city, you only have to go to 1% of the street segments. So 1% of 25,000 in Seattle, for example, is not a lot of places for you to go. Well, I was thinking that I can't point both. I I'm fine. I'll, I'll describe. <laughs> okay, now one of the things you might ask is, well, uh, okay, crime concentrates at a very small number of places, and that has some important implications for crime prevention. However, the question becomes, well, is it the same places? You know, there's a, a statistical concept that's called regression to the mean, and it says that when a, when a distribution goes up high, it will naturally go down. So maybe we've got is each year, it's a different group of places that are sort of problematic. What I did here was I took in Seattle the 25,000 street segments. I used a statistical technique. I traced the trajectory of each of those 25,000, right? Every street segment over 16 years, or in this case, 14 years, had a, a trajectory. And then I used a, stati a statistical technique to link those trajectories into groups, into trajectory groups. And that's what you have here. Now what you can see is at the top with the red line, there's this group that's very different from all the others. They average almost 100 crimes a year. That's a lot, I think. I wouldn't feel comfortable necessarily living on a block with that much crime, right? So, uh, but notice, it's the same places. So what happens here is, from 1989 to 2002, there's about 1% um, uh, of the streets in Seattle that produce 23% of the crime constantly. In other words, the same streets, so these chronic crime hotspots in the city over and over again. And that implies in terms of prevention, if we could disrupt that and bring those guys much closer to the other guys in this distribution, we could have an important impact on crime. So I hope you'll agree with me that we do have this uh, really interesting, uh, um, uh, what seems to be general principle, if you like, of a crime, which is a crime is very concentrated in hot spots in a city. And now the question is, of course, we want to take advantage of that. But I wanted to show you, because you could say to me, well, uh, you have a very small group of places that produce a lot of the crime, but those places are all in one place. <laughs> in other words, they're all in one neighborhood. And we have this, uh, we often uh, uh, do the following. We, I say we stigmatize bad neighborhoods. We say, oh, that's a bad neighborhood. Well, let's see what really happens in terms of crime. So this is Seattle. Uh, this is the 1% of the streets that consistently, the chronic crime hotspots, that produce about 23% of the crime in Seattle. And what you can see is they're everywhere. By the way, now I want to use my pointer, so I should have listened to you when you said something. OK. So uh, this, is, this is the bad part of town in Seattle. Uh, they don't call it, by the way, I think my work has had actually quite a lot of impact in Seattle. I knew that uh, when the, when the uh, mayor on his blog said, I'm reading David Weisberg's book. I, uh, on the criminology of place, uh, but it's also the case I've noticed that even city council members now are starting to talk about this even when they don't recognize where it comes from, but this is the bad part of town. There are 100 languages uh, spoken in that part of town, right? I mean, that's what happens, a, a large immigrant community. So now in Seattle, they don't, they don't say bad part of town. They say this is the most diverse part of Seattle, which is true. In terms of Crime, yeah, they have a lot of hot spots, but you know, not much more actually than the really nice part of town. This is really on a hill overlooking the water. It's beautiful. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, of a sort of bad neighborhood, I'd like to to take that away from you a bit. I think it's stigmatizing the people who live in those places. They may be poor, and may be disadvantaged, but it's not that there's crime in every street. Indeed, you can see they have relatively the same number of hot spots. By the way, this is a really problematic area. That's the University of Washington. <laughs> Those students, they are problematic. So uh, in the downtown area, we have a lot of hot spots, which would suggest to you that there's something about sort of the activities going on. We already get a sense of, of, uh, of an idea of what's generating this process. But something really interesting, if you look even here, you notice you can have hot spots running down the street, but there are no hot spots going this way. So obviously there's something already telling us there's, there's some generators here that are bringing us to having a lot of crime in specific places. But even here, there's a lot of street-by-street -street variability. By the way, another interesting thing, notice the movement of hotspots down an arterial road. 
right? I think that all fits our experience and again gives us some ideas of why crime is concentrated in certain sorts of places. Now, this is just a, another map like that. This is juvenile crime hotspot, so it's more focused than just sort of general crime. Again, you get a similar distribution. The bad parts of town, well, they have bunches of, of hotspots over here, but there's also up here, maybe a little less in the really wealthiest area. Again, the central business district has relatively a lot of uh, hotspots. We'll talk about activity spaces a bit later. My point is that uh, don't think that all these hotspots are just in one part of town. Indeed, indeed they tend to be spread throughout the city. Uh, you have hotspots in the worst parts of town, and uh, as this figure shows, most of the streets, uh, excuse me, you have hotspots in the best parts of town, and as this figure shows, most of the streets, even in the quote, bad parts of town are free of crime. So, and this, you have, this is the trajectory analysis I did. There are 20 some odd trajectories. The light colors here are not much crime or no crime, and the dark colors, like the red, is the chronic crime hotspots. Well, this is the bad part of town, right? And what do you notice? All the streets, not all, most of the streets don't have much crime. Right, so even in the, the sort of quote bad part of town, most of the streets are relatively free of crime. You do have, again, hotspots interspersed. And notice there's a lot of interspersion street to street. Uh, this is an important finding of a, a book that I'll mention later called The Criminology of Place. And we use a lot of hard-nosed statistical techniques, but I don't think they tell me more than the simple visual here, there's a lot of street by street variability in crime in the city. Don't think in terms of large areas. The police love to think in terms of large areas. Think in terms of very micro geographic problems of crime. Okay, so uh, we've got a, uh, a law of crime concentration that has important crime prevention implications. Uh, crime is very, very concentrated in a city. And I should note, by the way, uh, I, I mentioned it before that uh, 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 crime is also concentrated among people. About 6% of a cohort of, of young people produce about half the crime in that cohort, not very different from what we observed here. However, if you take 6% of a cohort in a large city, uh, you can get you know, uh, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of kids uh, in a, uh, uh, we're talking about 5% uh, uh, of 25,000 streets in a city like Seattle, the numbers are much smaller. And of course, not only the numbers are much smaller, in other words, the problem you have to deal with is smaller, it's also the case that those places don't move. And one of the hardest problems for the police, for example, is tracking down people. Do you know how many people there are walking around with warrants in your city, every city in the world? Because it's hard to find those people. So places stay in the same place, which is an important opportunity for crime prevention as well. Now, uh, the question becomes, well, what is it that pushes crime to those places? I mean, why is crime focused in certain specific places? Uh, and is crime tightly coupled to place? Because we all have an assumption, and that assumption, I'll tell you now, is wrong. We all have an assumption that crime is not coupled to place and it moves easily. Well, crime does not move easily, and we'll see that in a few minutes. But anyway, so let's take those juvenile crime hotspots I showed you earlier. Well, uh, uh, these are the sort of what's going on at those streets where uh, uh, the juvenile crime hotspots are. And not surprisingly, this is one of those cases where after I show you this, you say, why did you have to do this expensive research to find this out? But of course, uh, the point is there are many logic models. You can, you can probably build a different logic model for every phenomenon going every which direction. You need to know empirically which is the one that works. The logic model that people always gave me before was if you push down a crime in a hotspot, it'll go up. Uh, right around it, it moves around the corner. And I'll show you that logic model is not right. But anyway, so what do you find? It's schools, youth centers, shops, malls, restaurants. Well, is that surprising? I mean, where are the kids? Where do they hang out? Where are they socializing? There's a, a, a literature in sociology on unsupervised socializing. It says when you don't when you don't watch your kids, it's like, you know, there's all this evidence that parents that are home a bit more often, that can have a good effect on the kids because they're being supervised. School that has stronger supervision tends to have fewer problems. So, uh, but what happens is crime tends to develop among young people when they're socializing and they're hanging out with each other and there's some kids that are less problematic, more problematic, and they intersect with each other and change with each other. But anyway, when they're not supervised, you tend to have problems. So what we can assume here, I think, is that these are places, these are activity spaces for young people, right? And maybe the supervision there could be increased. We could reduce crime that way. So it's already provided us with a logic model. 
By the way, the importance of basic research is that it provides us, if you like, with the logic models we can use when we conduct applied evaluation research. So this is, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about work that's published in a book at Oxford University Press. It's called The Criminology of Place. It has great color maps. I was really impressed that I got Oxford to publish with color maps. Any of you that have done publishing, but they look great. Uh, I'm not going to, you've seen one of those maps before. That was in the color-coded street-by-street variability. But here you have the top, we had like 50 parameters, 50 different factors that could have been uh, explain why we were, you were a chronic crime hotspot or why a street was a chronic crime hotspot. And you can see here the top ones. This is the, you know, the, the top 10, so to speak. And uh, up there are things like employees, more employees in the street, more likely to be a hotspot. The number of residents, that's not surprising, but it's still important to know if you have more residents in a street. If the police, for example, know that a, a, a apartment buildings are built in the street, they ought to increase their patrol in those areas because you're likely to get an increase in crime. A high-risk juveniles. For every high-risk juvenile you have in a street, you increase the likelihood of being a chronic crime hotspot. Uh, in the jargon, we call that, I guess, motivated offenders, right? Now, this is not necessarily the kids being there, but it's also people that come, their friends that come to visit and hang out with them on the street. And by the way, there was a, a view that uh, the kids don't commit crime in areas right near their house, but there's actually an interesting article in Criminology, I believe, that just came out that suggests that it's true, and this data also suggests that. They do uh, cause trouble right nearby where they live. Um, arterial roads I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, if you have an arterial road, it's a, these are all opportunity factors, right? More potential victims, employees around. They might drive their cars to where they work. They might have money on Fridays and things of that sort. So that creates a potential for crime. More people around, more people to... Uh, uh, robbed from, maybe also more potential offenders. Um, High-risk juveniles, I mentioned they're motivated, potential motivated offenders. An arterial road is another opportunity factor. Uh, what do you have on arterial roads? First of all, it's easy to get around, it's easy to get there for the potential offenders. Secondly, there are a lot of people around. There are bus stops from which you could rob from, there are stores people are shopping in, they carry money, etc. So in part, what we've got here is the idea that opportunities at specific places, specific places have certain sorts of opportunities, and it's one of the reasons why they become chronic crime hotspots. Now that suggests, as a logic model, if we can increase the guardianship there, we can do something about crime. There's something called routine activities, a theory. It says there's a crime triangle in which you have motivated offenders, you have suitable targets, and, they, and, and crime will occur in the absence of a capable guardian. So we could bring capable guardians to that place. That's a logic model that my colleagues and I developed from this sort of research. But I want to point you to something else that I'll come to uh, a bit later as well. And Don, you want me to speak about 45 minutes? OK. So um, uh, what I'm going to go to next are our are, are guardianship, our police-based prevention methods, mostly guardianship. But I want to point out something interesting about these data. Of the top group of, of factors that affect, or at least that are correlated with being a crime hotspot, notice that we have um, property values. Higher property values, less likely to be a crime hotspot. We have physical disorder. If the place is more disorderly, they're more, it doesn't look as nice, more likely to be a chronic crime hotspot. And we have collective efficacy, which I measured through voting behavior. What we did was we said people that vote a lot are more willing to be involved in public affairs. That's a, a measure of collective efficacy. So when you're on a street and people are more likely to vote more often, it also turns out it's less likely to be a chronic crime hotspot. Now, I want to be cautious here because one problem with this sort of data, it's not a randomized experiment. I can't establish causality absolutely. But can I tell you that there are theories, the theory of social disorganization, that have been applied to large areas that link these variables to crime. Well, what happens is they think, seem to be linked to crime also at the microgeographic level. So I want to come back to that because that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. But first, I want to go to the area of policing. And I'm going to show you this strong evidence that this logic model works, that you can have an important effect on crime at hotspots. Let me tell you why this evidence is so important for those people that aren't police scholars. In the early 1990s, there was a general consensus among scholars and policymakers that the police could not do anything about crime, that what the police did was you know, you have a problem, you call them, they hold your hand, they may find the offenders afterwards, but they're not preventing crime. Indeed, uh, David Bailey, who's one of the, uh, at the time, was one of the most important police scholars and remains so, he said in, a, in the first page of a well-known book that he wrote, the police do not prevent crime, 
This is one of the best kept secrets of modern life. Experts know it, the police know it, but the public does not know it. Yet the police pretend that they are society's best defense against crime. This is a myth. That's a pretty strong statement from someone that's a friend of the police. He was on the commission in Ireland, for example, to reform the police. Likes the police, but he says, you know, the, the facts are the police can have an impact in crime. And Gofferson and Hershey, two well-known uh, criminologists, said basically the same thing. No evidence exists that augmentation of police forces or equipment, differential patrol strategies, or differential intensities of surveillance have an effect on crime rates. So when I began this research, uh, uh, people didn't have such an optimistic view about what the police could do about crime. And I actually thought that was wrong. My first job when I was finishing my PhD was at the Vera Institute of Justice in New York City. And what I did was I worked on a, with a group of uh, 12 officers on a community policing program. Each of the officers had a beat of uh, 20 square blocks. And when I walked with them, what I saw was they spent all their time at three blocks. That's where my idea of, I called it small worlds of crime or hot spots of crime developed. And I saw that when they focused on these streets, they could have an impact. So I was committed to the idea, not committed, but at least thought that they could have an impact. They just have to change the way they work. They have to focus on hot spots. And that led with Larry Sherman, who was doing work in Minneapolis and had identified that a very small number of addresses produce uh, a good deal of crime in the city. Uh, we came together and we decided to develop a randomized experimental field trial uh, on policing to test the hotspots idea. And uh, we used an experimental trial because we felt, given the strong statements that police can't do anything about crime, that we needed a methodology that would be convincing. And randomized experiments are the most convincing methodology. You can't take a medicine, at least in the United States, unless there's been a randomized trial showing it's effective. Simply put, you just, it's very simple. It's actually simpler than all the other statistical approaches. You randomize your your units. In this case, we had 110 hotspots of crime in Minneapolis. We randomized 55 to a treatment group, 55 to a control group. And what that means is the treatment group and the control group, they're not different. They're just randomly selected, those two groups. They're, there's nothing consistent about them that should be different. Uh, and then you look to see what happens when you apply treatment. This is the gold standard. It's uh, strong. By the way, it's one of the first randomized field trials uh, in policing. Uh, and what we did uh, in this case was we took 55 hotspots in the treatment group and we tried to, to have the police bring two to three times as much patrol in those hotspots as in the control hotspots. So there's a group getting a lot more patrol, guardianship, and a group getting uh, the standard amount of patrol. When they call the police, the police come. Now, um, I should note that we measured patrol, very expensive. This was about 20 years ago and about $400,000. Uh, we did observations in the streets to make sure the cops were bringing more patrol to those streets. And that was very important, as you'll see. So what we've got is, what we've got here is, this is the treatment group, this is the control group, and this is uh, the crime that year versus the previous year. So crime uh, relatively in the treatment group goes up a lot more than the control group. These results are statistically significant. It's about a 25% uh, drop in crime in the treatment hotspots. Uh, it's a very important finding. This is one of the first times anyone, perhaps the first time anyone's found that patrol, the police and their patrol efforts can have an impact on crime. You notice here things fall apart. It's good that we checked how much patrol was going on. This is Minneapolis. If any of you have been to Minneapolis, it's not like Sydney. It's about minus 80 below in the winter. It's very cold, maybe not that, that cold. And during the summer, the cops love to take vacation. The problem is that during the summer, kids also are off from school, and those two things don't work together so well. So right around here, when this thing breaks down, when we don't see an impact, uh, the dosage for the experimental group becomes exactly that for the control group. In other words, it's, it, it, it actually reinforces, I think, the findings. When you get the two to three times as much patrol, you get the effect. When it's gone, the effect is gone. Now, you can't rely on just one experiment to make a strong conclusion. There have now been about 25 tests of the hotspots patrol idea using sort of different approaches, sometimes with problem-oriented policing, sometimes with just patrol. The overall uh, findings there are, are pretty persuasive. Uh, this is line says no effect. It's called the forest plot. And the over here says you had a deterrent impact. And over here said it harmed, you had a backfire. And as you can see, on that side, can you see what I'm pointing over there? Is that okay? So what you see is all of the weight of these studies to the right, deterrence. 
And indeed, uh, this is, a, an, is from a meta-analysis. It's an overall statistic. There's a significant effect of hotspots policing across the studies. Uh, perhaps even more important, all of the randomized experiments, all of the sort of gold standard research shows it's a, a statistically significant impact for hotspots policing. So not only do we have a logic model, there's a lot of crime in a small number of places, go to those places. If you go to those places, you can have uh, an effect. Well, but doesn't crime just move around the corner? Well, that actually is the title of an article I wrote uh, in criminology, uh, but it actually, the title comes from the fact when I went out to visit Minneapolis when we were doing this experiment, I got in a car with two cops, and they immediately get on the radio and say, we have that crazy guy from Rutgers who's having us go to these places. Let's bring him down to the gym and talk to him. I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to do something. They were just joking, of course. But having said that, I said, man, it's really important to know, does crime just move around the corner? Because that logic model is very persuasive. Now, of course, you've already got a logic model against that. If there's a particular set of reasons why crime is at that place, maybe it's a youth center or a mall or a restaurant for kids, right? If you can do something and raise guardianship there, there's no mall and restaurant necessarily around the corner. Maybe in the center city there is, by the way, in certain places, but in general there isn't. So it may not move. So uh, I, I, I conducted a study with the Police Foundation, uh, and I got a police department that I worked with for a long time, Jersey City. Uh, to do uh, a study in which we would bring a lot of attention to a hotspot, in this case a multi-street hotspot, uh, and then we would keep the areas around uh, uh, with just a routine police response. In other words, you don't take crime prevention resources from these people. If people call the police, they have to come. But you don't add something. So we added, I call it the atomic bomb. I'm not sure you could do it today. There was a lot of money around for crime prevention. They did everything. Reverse stings, you know, where you send in people to pretend to be prostitutes or drug dealers. Uh, they had a prosecution approach uh, where they uh, fast-tracked uh, particular offenders to, uh, to, uh, 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 to get them off the street really quickly and to keep them off the street. Uh, they used uh, uh, approaches where they, they had uh, ten, about 10 cops assigned to each of these small areas. This is the prostitution site. This is the hotspot right here. It's a walk for prostitutes. This was a period in the United States when crime was really intense at a level that here in Australia you probably can't imagine. Uh, this is a drug and violent crime hotspot. We took this area around is a the first catchment area, this is the second catchment area, the same here, same here. Uh, so we had a, a, like 10 officers assigned to this hot spot of a few streets, all these special activities. We had a, a group uh, uh, from the government together to say, what are the best things you can do? We use the best evidence. And we wanted to see what happens uh, uh, at the hot spot. We thought crime would go down. And does it just displace around the corner? I should note that we, we created a group of mechanisms to keep the guys in here out of here. In other words, you called the police, you got service, but these guys did not go there. One of the mechanisms we used, I would advise it, is you had to write a report every time you left the treatment area. The cops do not like to write reports, so that was a very, very useful approach. Okay, so here are the, some of the findings. This is for, uh, in the prostitution site for prostitution. Here's before treatment, here's right after treatment. So the exp bringing 10 cops and having them there really lowered the level of prostitution an awful lot in the street. It keeps about the same through the treatment period. But this is the catchment area, first catchment area. Now if there was just crime moves around the corner, this would have gone way up like this, right? Oops, like that, but it didn't. In fact, it follows the same model. Uh, and this is what Ron Clark and I call a diffusion of crime control benefits. There was not only do the areas ne nearby not get worse, they actually get better. And that happens for the second catchment area as well, right? So we don't see displacement here, and we neither see displacement at the drug crime, violent crime site. Uh, it's a different pattern. You can see it starts here, goes down, but it's sort of consistent going down. I suspect that might have something to do with the offender removal program of the prosecutor uh, uh, taking people off the street. But in any event, that's what happens through the, treat through the uh, treatment period. Again, if there was displacement, if crime just moved around the corner easily, it would have gone up. No, it follows the same pattern. Things get better in the areas around. And it's not just my study. There's now been a meta-analysis by Anthony Braga and colleagues. And he, again, finds studies that examine displacement, not all of them, uh, 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 some of them experiments. And what you can see here, this is the line. On this side is displacement, and this side is diffusion. 
And you see, most of the weight of the studies is towards the areas around. Not that you never get displacement, but the weight of, of studies is if you're trying to do a good job at crime prevention and hotspots, you get a diffusion of crime control benefits in the nearby areas. And indeed, there's a significant uh, effect of diffusion of crime control benefits. So that's kind of against our logic model. So what's the logic model we can use? Well, what explains that? Well, first of all, Crime is coupled to place. You saw that in what I showed you earlier from the basic research. One of the reasons why basic research is so important. It helps us understand what's in the black box. The same opportunities don't necessarily exist in the areas immediately surrounding. Quite often, on many of the streets in Seattle, you'll have a, an activity space that generates crime, maybe uh, uh, shopping or something else. The next street over is a residential street. You're not going to have all that crime move to a residential street. You may have a, f a few problems move, but we've seen diffusion of crime control benefits. Why would that happen? Well, first of all, sometimes when you, you focus on a hot spot, you take offenders off the street. They might have been uh, bothering people nearby as well. It's also the case that people, when they see things are better, they hang out in the street more often. People are also guardians. Citizens are also guardians. And, and they might also help in reducing crime in the streets nearby. But there's another interesting reason. In this study we did in Jersey City, we also looked at, uh, we also did some qualitative work. I advise those of you that are quantitative researchers, qualitative research can really be interesting and important. Uh, we did ethnographic work. We sent an eth ethnographers to the drug site and the uh, and the prostitution site. They couldn't work in the drug site because they almost got killed, so we had to pull them out. Uh, but we also did interviews with offenders after they were arrested uh, in both sites. And what we found was not only is crime coupled to place, but criminals are coupled to place. So one respondent told us, for example, it's, why don't you move? There's all these cops around. It's like, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a heyday for cops in the area. They said the money won't be the same. We have to start from scratch. And it takes time to build up customers. So in other words, they have some of the same responses that any business would have. Another said, you can't really deal in areas you aren't living in. It ain't your turf. That's how people get themselves killed. Now, they get themselves killed in two ways. One is you go to another area. You don't know it, right? You don't know who calls the police. So you don't know who, the, from your perspective, the good guys and the bad guys are. They have a different perspective than you do. So uh, they like to work in an area where they know if they see a guy and they know he's a problem, they go inside. But you go to a new place, you don't know the turf. It's a dangerous thing. The other thing is you go to a new place, that place might have someone that is already there, and that person might kill you, especially in drug dealing, right? You go to a different place, and it's already a good place for drugs. They might do away with you. Now, finally, I think it's really important to recognize something we don't recognize. Offenders are just like the rest of us. They, they don't like chains. They don't like redoing their hair. They check their clothing out. They, they want to feel comfortable. So uh, uh, one person said, for, uh, uh, one prostitute, for example, said, up on, why don't you move up on the hill where there's a lot of prostitution? I don't, up on the hill, I don't know the people at that end of town. Another woman told us, said, we said, well, just a few blocks away, there's a place, what about that? They weren't supposed to ask that question directly, but I like the answer. The answer was, I don't feel comfortable with those girls. They're not my type of girls. Yeah, that's the same kind of thing we all think about, where we feel comfortable, where we want to be. So people, uh, offenders, become coupled to certain places where they're familiar, they know the people, et cetera. It's not so easy for them to move. Now, on the basis of, of much of the research I've showed you, the National Academy of Sciences in the US uh, made the following statement. Studies that focus police resources on crime hotspots provide the strongest collective evidence of police effectiveness that is now available. Indeed, the research evidence suggests the diffusion of crime control benefits to areas surrounding treated hotspots is stronger than any displacement outcomes. And this was part of the report on what's known about police practice and policies. So we have a good logic model. We have very strong scientific evidence, in this case, uh, uh, reinforced by the National Academy of Sciences that reviewed it. Uh, so yeah, we have a great logic model, good scientific evidence for why hotspots, place-based prevention should, should be something we should think about. And we also know, uh, have research says yes, it, it actually has strong crime prevention impacts. Let me end, and I'll just take five more minutes. I think I'm going a little bit over, but okay. Because uh, I'd like to talk about social prevention. It's, my, it's kind of a new thing. I must say, it's funny to me. I get invited a lot all over the world. Uh, and people say, talk, David, talk about hot spots of crime and policing. And I say, well, I'm kind of getting interested in something else right at the moment. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. In this case, I should have Don was very good. He said, just talk about something you think would be interesting to us. But let me tell you about uh, the prevention. I don't have a lot of evidence, but I think it's really interesting. 
So remember I showed you earlier that there were these factors that in the jargon you'd call social disorganization factors. Elements that the community's weak, if you like, at these streets. And these factors vary street to street. It's amazing. Not only does crime vary street to street, but some of that collective efficacy varies street by street. And we always think of things like collective efficacy or social disorder as being neighborhood characteristics. It turns out within a neighborhood, there's tremendous variability. And again, it's an opportunity to take advantage of that variability. Now, in that book I showed you before, I also report on trends of crime. And one of the things I find is, it says, well, what's the trends when you see crime increasing in a city, on, on, on specific streets? By the way, it's very interesting in Seattle. Seattle had a crime drop like most American cities in the 1990s, and you're having a crime drop here now as well. During the crime drop in Seattle, the entire crime drop is restricted to 14% of the streets. In other words, the rest of the streets either didn't have a change or crime went up. For 14% produced the crime drop. 2% of the streets had crime waves, and I'm talking about 100% increases in crime. So even during a period of the crime drop, the police have a lot of work to do if they focus themselves carefully. Because obviously what happens is sometimes when crime is going down dramatically in some places, in a smaller number of places it may be going up dramatically. But anyway, what, what, what is related to these crime increase? Decreasing property values. Property values go down, crime increases. Increased housing assistance. Housing, again, these are all indicators of poverty and social disorganization. It goes down, crime increases. Increased racial heterogeneity. In other words, communities moving in, mixing up the neighborhoods. That also leads to increases in crime, or at least is correlated with increases in crime. Increased physical disorder. It, as this physical disorder goes up, <clears throat> uh, crime goes up. Uh, more true in juveniles. As you get more true in juveniles in the street, crime goes up. And fewer active voters. Collective FC goes down on the street, crime goes up. Now, be careful because causation is hard to, to identify in these observational studies, not experimental studies. So that's what I'm trying to do now. I want to move in this direction. Let me just show you something really quick. This is a, a new study I have. It's supported by the National Institutes of Health. What am I doing at the National Institutes of Health? Uh, Willie Sutton once, once was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So what I'm doing at the National Institute of Health is I, I needed to do a prospective longitudinal study, and I knew it would cost a few million dollars, and the only place I could think of that would do it was the NIH, and I convinced them how important this was, uh, not only for crime, but for public health. We have lots of interesting public health measures. On hot spots of crime, um, uh, 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 depression is twice that as on cool spots. Post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome is three times that. But anyway, this is, these are questions here about trust, which is an element of collective efficacy of people working together. Look at the differences. People on your block can be trusted. The worst hot spots, 56% said yes. In the cold spots, 92% said yes. That's a gigantic difference. Uh, people on your block usually do not get along with each other. On the cool spots, no crime, 7%. On the hottest spots, 24%. So it's not just voting behavior. Streets that have a lot of crime have these elements of social disorganization as well. So what's the opportunity here? Well, you know, what we did in policing was we told the police, stop wasting your resources. Focus them. Use an efficient approach. Focus in on hot spots, and you'll get a bang for your buck. The same is true for social interventions. Right now, social interventions are falling out of style, at least in the US. Government has no money. They don't want to invest large amounts of money in housing across the city, et cetera. In fact, I've noticed here they're selling off public housing and other things to make money for government. The government is hurting, so a lot more money is not going to work. Well, what happens if I don't have to go to 1,000 streets in a neighborhood? We don't have to go to 50 streets. And if I concentrate in those 50 streets, I can change the social context of those streets. I can use social prevention. Not that expensive anymore. Very efficient because I'm focusing, just like with the police. And that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. So here are two quick studies. In Brooklyn Park, uh, uh, Minnesota, also very cold in the winter. Uh, they, I have to start doing studies in Southern California. I do as well. But, uh, or in Sydney, the weather here is gorgeous. Uh, what we're doing here is we know the police in Brooklyn Park have about 25% about of patrol time is free. They're not doing anything. So the police department is going to take that 25%. We're going to do a, a training course for the police for a, a two-day training course. 
and we're going to assign different pleas to different hotspots in the city. Uh, they're going to be 22. It's a randomized experiment. 22 experimental hotspots, 22 uh, patrol. So we're going to take all that 25% of the time. They're going to those streets. They're going to try to meet people, talk to them, ask them what their problems are, try to sort of reinforce people that want to become active as a way of sort of utilizing social prevention at the street segment level. And of course, when they're there, they'll also be guardians. But part of what we want to do here, we want them to change the sort of dynamic Dynamic. Why? Because guardians, they leave, you got the same problems. If you can change those streets and, and make some of those citizens better guardians, working more, uh, better together with the police, then you'll have more of an effect. Anyway, so that's the Brooklyn Park uh, Collective Efficacy Experiment. Uh, in two years, speak to me again, or a year and a half, and I'll tell you whether it worked. We have an, another study in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's not funded yet, but we think the MacArthur Foundation and some foundations in Pittsburgh are going to help us because it's really expensive. And here's why it's expensive. We're identifying a problematic neighborhood in this case, a place where housing values, problematic not for crime necessarily, housing values are very low, people don't want to live there. Uh, we're identifying hotspot streets, and we're buying property on those hotspot streets, and we're going to improve the property. Not to bring in rich people where poor people are. This is low-income housing property, the way we're going to do it. We're trying to just improve, make the neighborhood stronger. Make the people who live there, make them better able to participate with the police in doing something about crime. So that's, I think, very exciting. That may take even longer because we're still getting it set up. But anyway, I think, you'll, I think these guys kind of said it all, right? Location, location, location. You ought to be thinking more about where done it. Uh, certainly in policing, there's a lot of evidence that the idea of we're done it is very uh, important and can help you with crime prevention. But I also think you ought to be thinking a bit about social prevention at that level as well. I mean, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm sure there are questions, but this is my one opportunity to slip a question in before you do. So my question is this, David. We've had uh, or, or organised a couple of experiments with the police. They absolutely love being in the experimental group. They hate being in the comparison group. So what's the trick to persuading police to be in the comparison group in these studies? Yeah, I mean, one approach is, is, you know, when you can blind an experiment, that's the best way. In, in uh, Israel, we had a, have an experiment in which we assigned hot spots in a city. We never told anybody about the cool spots. In other words, the police didn't have any data. We used the national level. So obviously, that would be optimal because they don't know where it is. Uh, yeah, it's a, I think in this case, it's an education issue and a tracking issue. Uh, in other words, it's very important to keep track of what's going on. And when you see there's a problem, uh, you need to say, hey, we got a problem. You're bringing treatment to the control areas. It's a gigantic issue. This is why it's very important not just to design an experiment, but to pay careful attention to what's going on, to understand the craft of policing. Like in Jersey City, this idea of keeping them out of the other areas. Uh, the, the deputy chief said to me, let's write up a report. <laughs> like, let's have a report. Yeah, part of it is education. You know, what police sometimes don't recognize. Here's how most practitioners work, and I think it's great. They, they, most practitioners love what they do. I don't know what your experience is. I not love what they do, but they care. Most police I know want to do good. They didn't become police to be corrupt or bad. They want to do good. Most of the corrections people I know, they want to do good, especially people that work in rehabilitation. They really, that's why they're there. They don't make a lot of money. They're trying to make the world a better place. Now, the problem is that that often means that they really believe what they're doing helps. And they don't recognize sometimes cures not only help, don't help, they harm. And I think it's very important to bring the forward. What you're doing may harm. Just a quick example, there's too long a response, but the first experiment in criminal justice was in the 1930s at Harvard. And they took a, 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 over 400 young kids and they randomized them into a treatment group, they were juvenile delinquents, and a control group. And the treatment group got everything you could imagine people thought was good, counseling, um, uh, 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 help in school, uh, work with the teachers, summer camp. It was like the, the world's largest program at the time. It was great. And uh, the program was billed as a success when it was run. The social workers said it was a success. The teachers said it was a success. The camp counselors said it was a success because they were working hard to do good, right? 20 years later, Joan McCord did a follow-up. The treatment group had a significantly higher offending rates than the control group. What happened? Well, I think you know what happened because there's always an alternative logic model. What's the alternative logic model? Alternative logic model, don't send criminals to camp together. It's like a training group, for God's sake, right? So 
The point I'm making is that it, it, when practitioners understand those issues, they understand the idea, let's test it with this group and try it for six months. And if it works, we're going to give it to everybody. But let's beware. What you could do could harm people. We work in the, era, era, in the area of social control. Social control can harm. anything like that that in Sydney we have neighbourhood watch groups in various suburbs um, obviously um, the enthusiasm with which people enhance that to sort of keep in touch and tell neighbours if they're going on holidays and things like that varies but do you have a similar thing in the US that you could use uh, for your street by street analysis and social analysis? Yeah, I don't think Neighborhood Watch has been evaluated at the street level and I'm trying to remember what the evaluations say at the larger level. I think that the, there's a, a, a small overall a success effect, by the way. I'm trying to remember. There was a review done by a fellow in the UK. Uh, it was a Campbell review. So if you look in the Campbell Collaboration Review site, it should be there. Yeah, see, my approach would be this. Uh, there are two functions to a, a program like Neighborhood Watch. One is to get the community involved. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's always good when the police are involved with people. You know, uh, positive relations with the police are great because the citizens there are lots and lots of citizens. There are very few police. The citizens are surveillance all the time. They can tell you when something's suspicious, if there was a guy around, etc. So there's no question that any, any of these programs that create positive relationships with the police are good. If you're asking me whether, how I think you should arrange the program, well, to me, I, there's no point. If, you're, if crime is the goal, there's no point in a neighborhood watch on a street, necessarily, that hasn't seen a crime for 10 years. And in Seattle, there are streets that never have any crime. Never, you know, uh, at least crime incidents. Someone might call the police for their cat or something like that, but, but never have crime. Um, so, yeah, I would still say focus it, but I, I don't have a, a good answer for you. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering what happened to your arrest rates in your hotspot. So did you see the drop in crime because the police were going in and arresting everyone who looked suspicious, or were they deterring people from committing crime in the first place? Yeah, measurement is a real problem, isn't it? Because if you have a police program that focuses in on a particular street, you, you're likely going to make a lot more arrests on that street, right? So if you use arrest as a measure. Yeah, in the, it depends on which study you're talking about. In the patrol studies in Minneapolis, in Sacramento, uh, arrest is not an issue. It's really just uh, uh, guardianship. You don't have uh, large increases, significant increases in arrests, and you have decreases in crime. In studies where you're using you know, intensive police activity, uh, problem-oriented policing or crackdowns, obviously you have increases of arrests. Uh, in the Jersey City experiment I showed you, because of that, we measured prostitution and drug activities by using observations. We did systematic social observations in the street. So those are observations of what's going on in the street in terms of drug activity. Very expensive, by the way, but, you know, if you're worried about reactivity of measures, in that case, uh, works out well. Street crime, just wondering whether uh, how domestic crime might fit into models such as this. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I wrote a proposal on that. It wasn't funded. <laughs> a foundation was, uh, wrote me and said, we're interested in domestic violence. I said, OK, I'll, we'll do it. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I think the, uh, on the level I'm working out quite often, uh, the number of cases is relatively small when you start looking at specific types of crime. Um, the, uh, we don't have evidence yet on domestic violence. We have evidence on robberies, on, on certain sorts of crime, and you can have an effect on specific sorts of crime. Uh, robberies, uh, serious violent crime shootings are incredibly concentrated in a very small number of places, right? Just like the general crime is, which is interesting to me, because I would have thought shootings would be a lot more spread out, but no, they're, they're, they're just a, a, a relatively small number of places. Uh, domestic violence is really interesting, because you have to ask, what is the logic model for why it would work. I remember writing this proposal trying to think through a logic model. The, uh, yeah, if the police are around, maybe people will tell them things. You know, in the US, at least, if some of the street says to a cop, you know, that woman there, they're streaming from the apartments, they usually do something now. They feel an obligation to do it. They now recognize that's not just appropriate behavior between a man and a woman. So uh, it might have effects in that way in terms of access. 
But the question is, what kind of effect would it have on indoor crime or frauds or things of these sort? Uh, those are good questions. In frauds, I've thought of, you, you'd have to th maybe think of a different sorts of hotspots, though a lot of frauds are low-level frauds like check frauds, and those, I suspect, will operate in the same t type of concentrations that we observe here. But this is, I, and I gave a speech at the uh, American Society of Criminology, the keynote address this year, and, and I was trying to sort of reach to the general criminologists that don't think much about where done it, perhaps. And I said, you know, there are just great opportunities here for people. I mean, there have been relatively, there are, on the Wolfgang finding of 6% of uh, young people producing 50% of the crime, there have been thousands of studies now. There have been a handful of studies on uh, the concentration of crime. There are all kinds of really interesting questions, so you guys can go out and look at those. That'd be great. Uh, David, uh, the general long-term trend in Western nations that you were talking about in violent crime decline. Uh, 20 years, everyone's taking responsibility. The left-wingers are saying it's rehabilitation. The right-wingers are saying it's because we've got more guns on the streets, more people behind bars. You're saying it's good hotspot policing. The churches are saying we're more God-fearing. What is your take on the long-term violent crime decline? Look, first of all, I didn't say that the crime decline is due to policing. I don't think anyone knows what, what is causing sort of general crime decline around the world. What I can say is that there's solid scientific evidence that if the police carry out these sorts of strategies, they can have an impact. The, the, uh, an issue I'm looking at now, another issue I didn't talk about is I'm trying to develop studies that will tell me what the, the uh, uh, area-wide impact is of hotspots policing. So I got the head of the Columbia National Police to agree to a randomized experiment in which I would bring hotspots policing to Columbia and we'd randomly allocate police forces and I was really excited about that. But then he had the goal of telling the president he was doing a bad job and that led to him being fired and there went my experiment. <laughs> so, uh, but I've got a, a group of studies, I'm developing one now in Milwaukee where we're going to do uh, beat-based uh, effects as well. So. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about this issue is what would be the overall uh, effect on crime in the city from moving to this sort of strategy. It's an important question. Right now we know you can have an effect on hot spots. That's important, by the way. The people who live there are going to be pretty happy. Crime's going down. These are often shopping districts, good for people as well coming into those places. We know it's not just moving around the corner. In terms of long-term crime sense, I'm sitting on a panel, the, uh, a round table of the National Academy of Sciences now on long-term uh, crime trends. Rick Rosenfeld is the chair. Uh, my take on this is as follows. My daughter was a research assistant for Alan Greenspan in the US, who was a very famous head of the Fed. And he used to have her do things like, uh, go out and tell me how many trucks were, were bought in, in Wilmington, Vermont, how many of those trucks brought goods to Detroit, Michigan. In other words, these were really specific questions. And they would track economic indicators like that at an incredible specific level. Now, the Fed has a data collection network that would knock our socks off. We don't have that. If you want to know the answer, or at least have an idea of the answer for why crime is declining uh, over time, you need to develop the kind of data collection before the fact. It's almost impossible. We're all after the fact. Why did crime go down? Hell, who the hell knows? There's no experiments. What's the causality? Now, having said all that, I think that uh, uh, the police deserve uh, uh, in the West some credit for the crime decline. Okay, How much of the credit? The work I've done suggests they definitely deserve some credit. There's some studies citywide that suggest uh, the police should get part of that package. Obviously, there's a, there's, there's a lot of things affecting crime. Um, yeah, sometimes you can't, people want cheap answers. There is no cheap answer to this question. I don't know anyone to do it. Just one more comment. It's not true that, uh, it depends how you look at things. If you look at uh, murder rates uh, from the uh, Middle Ages, they've been going down. When, when, I, when I heard that described, I said, well, what about the Holocaust? Did murder rate goes down during the Holocaust? I mean, give me a break. It's very hard to think of this. But overall, murder rates, official murder rates, go down in a consistent pattern. However, crime in the United States goes like this. A colleague of mine, Dan Nagin, is speaking now, and he says, he talks about getting ready for the next crime increase. I'm not sure we should uh, uh, believe somehow that we're, we're on a trend that's going to last forever. You've had a 70% decline in serious crime over the last decade in 
Australia, is that right? Something like that. That's incredible. I'm suspecting you want to keep that down. Don't expect it's just going to stay down. We've got time for one or two more questions. <clears throat> Uh, how public is that and what is that and what has that done to civic pride and real estate prices? <laughs> it's questions like that that get me into trouble actually. Um, yeah, um, I must say that this is becoming more and more of an issue in this data uh, because uh, I've, I've gotten access to the Israeli census data and this issue of being able to identify streets, uh, I've gotten permission to do it. But these kind of questions get raised. Look, uh, cities in the US, uh, in Israel, uh, in Europe, they all vary tremendously depending on the unit that's controlling the data in terms of what's available. There are cities in the US now where you can get point data, literally, uh, on the streets, or at least at the street segment level. Uh, most cities allow you to get uh, data on s very small area level, groups of streets, et cetera. What effect does it have? Uh, yeah, it, it, I, it's hard to say how real estate agents are using it. Uh, I don't think enough cities have that data. Uh, by the way, there are, there are private companies selling that data now. Uh, Info USA, I don't know if you have that here, if there's an Info Australia. They are literally collecting everything you could possibly imagine and selling it, and businesses are buying it. So this data is becoming more available. What I'd say is this. Does the public have a right to know where crime is occurring in the city? Does the public have a right? I mean, it's an important question. The police used to say 20 years ago, the public have no right to know. Our data is our data. We do not have to share it with the public. I think that's the wrong approach. Transparency is usually a good thing in the long run in government. The more and more that the public expects its, its institutions to be responsive to it, I think the more it's their right to know about things. Now, having said that, I think we have to consider the ethical issues and the privacy issues. If there's only one house in the street and you report there are 10 crimes, well, that may have implications for an individual. So the level at which you release data to the public, for example, it's, it's an important issue. But police agencies, other security agencies, their immediate response to everything is it's secret. I was once working with the Israeli government uh, and on terrorism, and like every single thing was secret. I said, like, how could all that be secret? That's impossible. You have so much secret, nothing is secret. The end result of that, by the way, is these things where someone releases all those data. If I have to keep track of 10 documents and hide it in my drawer, I can. But if everything from breathing to talking becomes secret, so beware of that knee-jerk reaction. Maybe crime data right now, this month, because of investigations, is something you should uh, keep as private. But it seems to me that more and more open. I was in China, I made this case. You can imagine what response I got. Uh, I almost got kicked out of China, actually, on this basis. But uh, I don't care. It's, I think this is the important idea. Certainly in Australia, the US, we should be a lot more open with data. Thank you. Very Thank much. you very much. Thank you.